car, the first person outside GM to drive a Corvette convertible. Yeah, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so this is the only Corvette convertible in the state of California. Yes, it is. All right, let's put the top up. Yeah, the nice thing about this car is if you're going under 30 miles an hour, yeah. you decide you want the top top down or top up. Oh, my hair. OK, OK, I'll put the top up. <laughs> put it up. 16 seconds. And she's done. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. We are very excited today to feature the 2020 Corvette Stingray convertible. I know it looks like a hard top, but it's a convertible. The whole thing folds into the into the trunk. You'll see that in a second. You know, we were lucky enough to be at the introduction of the new Corvette a while back in Tustin, California and got to drive it just for anybody else. I mean, it was inside a big hangar, but you got the feel of the car. It is a totally new automobile at an incredible price point, which nobody could believe at the time. Uh, it really makes you proud of American engineering and American innovation, the fact that they're able to get this much technology in and around the $60,000 uh, price point. Uh, I mean, these guys have done an amazing job. And let's meet the man with, I think, the best job in Detroit, chief engineer for Corvette, uh, Taj Chukter. Am I saying it right? It's the hardest You got thing. it, Jay. It's Taj Chukter. All these. I've known Thank you for years, and I keep <laughs> tripping over it all the time. It's tough. It's difficult. But it is. I, I think you have the best job in Detroit, working on uh, the most exciting project. You know, you're not doing door handles for the Chevy Bolt or anything. That's where is, I started, I mean, well, you doing jobs like that. Yeah, yeah but, but it's cool. But to move up to this, and what you've done is really amazing. And I have to say, it takes a lot of guts to change a product like a Corvette, which has always been front engine. And just reading the comments, before the car was out, it was hysterical. People mad about the taillights <laughs> aren't round, or it's not a Corvette. With a, I will never buy another Corvette. And, you know, and it's a problem, I think, that Harley Davidson had and that Porsche has. They have a product so popular, oh my god, you make any change. Right. You know, like the 911, when the 928 came out, the 944, boo, boo, people just, yeah. I mean, they were wonderful cars, but unfortunately it didn't, because people just wanted the 911. And with the Corvette, it was the same thing. People just furious moving the engine to the back. But I mean, obviously it's progress. And right away, you see how dated the earlier Corvettes are when you get in this and you drive it. Was there a lot of internal sort of strife and arguments about making yes really of... i mean way back from Dor zora's day right he was trying to get us to go mid-engine in the 60s right and he encountered a lot of resistance at the company why would you mess with success why would you tamper with a good thing don't fix it if it isn't broken that kind right, of thing right, right. and he was unsuccessful uh, at convincing the leadership to make the move and so now here we are 66 years later and finally doing it and it was really a confluence of a lot of things, but the answer is yes. Uh, there was a lot of initial resistance to moving the engine to the back. Uh, we were selling a lot of front engine cars. People loved them. They raved about them. Right. Uh, it was a good business for us, so why would you tamper with that? Ultimately, physics forced us to tamper with it. Right. If we wanted to push the performance envelope out, we had to move the engine to the back, get the power to the ground. Because even the base model Corvette, the new base model, 2020, is faster to 60 miles an hour than the current top of the line ZR1, isn't it? Not That's quite, but almost. But, but so I mean, here we have the standard car, right. $60,000 car, right. and it's just about as quick to 60 yeah. as a $120,000 car. Yeah, I mean, so that's, that's progress. That's real progress, and that's pretty amazing. I mean, I mean, I, I've got a C5 and a C6, and I love them because you know you can go to Home Depot and put some lumber in the back if you uh -huh. want. You've got all kinds of trunk space. <laughs> but this has got pretty good trunk space front and back as well. Yeah, if you're gonna fill it with water, yeah. it's about the same. But really? it's divided differently, and the shapes are different. So right, right. But you, you don't have, really travel with water. We don't. No, not a lot of people put water. Or sand. <laughs> yeah, you don't fill it with sand. sand. You don't want to go with sand. You don't want to go with sand. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but in previous generation of Corvettes, there was always carryover. I mean, when the C2 came out, it was really the C1 chassis with a different body, and yeah. so consequently, you could. Uh, amortize the cost of yes. parts. I remember when I took my 55 Buick apart, we were uh, modifying <laughs> it for SEMA, and some GM guys, and somebody looked at a piece and went, you know, we're still using that. We're still using <laughs> that little, it was just a, a bracket. Yeah. But you realize, they've been making a bracket for 60 years, so they can make it for half a penny at this point, you know. Whereas yeah. this, it's totally 
Completely. This car really is. And uh, you're looking back over the Corvette generations, some of them were clean sheet and others were more evolutionary. Right. This one really was clean sheet. It had to be when we brought out the coupe just a couple months ago. We said there was only one carryover part that was a little latch for the removable right. roof behind your head. So now we're looking at a retracting hardtop. There is nothing carryover on this right. one. And even the coupe is really a convertible, isn't it? Do you call it because you can lift the, the top off? I didn't realize that when it came out. I, yes. I found that out when I was there. Is it technically a convertible if you can take the roof off and put it It is. If there's no structure be between the behind you and right, the no windshield, T there's no T-top or anything. Right, so right. in the eyes of the regulators, the government, right. technically in the auto industry, it's technically a convertible, even though we call it a coupe. Right. And the two cars had to be designed simultaneously because the body structure has to be good with the roof out. Uh, the retracting hardtop is unusual. We usually bring out the convertible quite a bit behind the coupe. Right. This time we're bringing out bang, bang. We just, we haven't even sold the first coupe yet and we're already introducing the convertible. Yeah, yeah. And that's because we really had to design them very tightly together. Is there, this is maybe what? 75 pounds, 100 pounds heavier than the coupe? It's about 80 pounds. About 80 pounds, than, okay, yeah. okay. Which is pretty amazing. It's pretty and, good. And so there is no more soft top convertible anymore. Although it's a convertible, it's a retracting, metal heart that goes kind of yeah, walk like an Egyptian thing. Two shell pieces yeah. that come back. Yeah, so it's, it's all rigid materials, magnesium yeah. and composites. Uh, it makes it much more challenging. Uh, canvas top obviously folds. You can bend the, the exterior material. So the kinemat, we call it. Right. Uh, it's a lot more flexible for packaging in small spaces. So this is a very challenging packaging operation. And of course, with the hard top, you can, you've got the glass piece so you can see the the engine and the internals as well. Uh, yes. t tell us about the chassis structure. I remember when we went to the uh, unveiling, they had kind of the raw chassis there on display, which is just amazing. It is, that's all engineers gravitate towards that. Yeah. And that's really literally the backbone of the car. So it's all aluminum, um, composites of various kinds, uh, glass-based, mix of glass and carbon and all carbon. Uh, so when you were talking about the technology, that is a lot of the technology in the car. How do you get those kind of materials properly applied to make this the stiffest open Corvette we've ever done? So with the roof up or roof down, the car feels the same. It feels like a closed roof car. Right. You don't even realize you're driving a convertible because it's so stiff. Well, the thing I think that really freaked out most people was the price point. I, like everyone else, assume they'll continue to build the C7, at the sixty to eighty thousand dollar price point, and then oh, the mid engine will be uh, one twenty five, like the Viper is, or one fifty or one eighty or something. You know, I mean the NSX mid engine V six. That's by the time you're out the door, it was two hundred five thousand dollars. Yeah. I mean, how you're able to build it for that? Like I just assumed the base model would have you know, some sort of torque converter transmission with the usual excuse, we're saving weight, you know, that kind. <laughs> but the fact that you've engineered really all the top European features, I mean, cars that cost a quarter million dollars and up, this has exactly the same features, dual clutch gearbox, right? Custom, Custom for us, a spoke. Yeah. Okay, so everything is almost bespoke in this, isn't it? It really is, yeah. a lot of it is. Uh, Per completely unique to this car. We have a lot of unique suppliers that provide uh, these parts. Uh, we've developed along with them for the last 60 years uh, on doing Corvettes. We do benefit from being part of a very large company, General right. Motors, so there's economies of scale in a lot of the things we do. Certainly the engine uh, is one place that we have huge leverage because right. it's, uh, you know, it, it's a very high performance version of the small block V8 that we make in large But quantities. see, I would think the disadvantage sometimes of big company is you go to them and then go, look, you know, we've got this transmission we've used for years. It works fine. Why don't you use this? Or we've got these other pieces. Why go bespoke when we've got this sitting on the shelf? I mean, is that a hard case you have to make when, when you, obviously a dual clutch gearbox, especially bespoke one, is more expensive, more complex. Do you have to sell that to the uh, sort of the accountants in the upper echelon? Or That's is it just a matter of, guys, build the best thing you can, you know what I mean? Oh, uh, that's part of the whole sales pitch for the whole car. We knew when we were going mid-engine, we wouldn't be able to take a lot of the traditional components off the shelf and right. use them. The architecture demands a different packaging arrangement. And uh, customers, honestly, have been asking for a DCT for uh, quite some time. You really want that continuous torque during a shift and the speed right. of the shifts 
for a performance car. So we had two reasons to do that. So it was a sales pitch, sure, uh, but it was part of selling the whole car. Once the car was sold, we've had fantastic support from the leadership at GM to do what we need to do to execute this car. But, but I mean, there's nothing on this car that's not on any of the European exotics. And even if you go to Pagani and some of those, those aren't even dual clutch transmission. They're torque converters in them, you know? Yeah. I mean, brakes. We're pretty proud with all the content we have. Oh, I, I, all the composites, yeah. you know, it's not a full carbon exterior, but we do use carbon and, and we've got a lot of aluminum. There's almost no steel in the car left. So a lot of the people we compete with still use some aluminum, some steel. Right. Uh, so we're kind of at the top echelon being so far into composites. Tell us about the brakes. The brakes are shared with uh, the coupe, of course. Uh, this one we're looking at is the Z51 package. So when you get Z51, you get uh, larger brakes. Uh, for the first time, we're actually marking Z51 on the brakes. Oh, I see. Customers okay. like to brag that they have that content. So right. we put it right on there. You can and see it right away. And where does Z51 come from? What, what, is, what is the derivation of 51? We have regular production options, RPO, so those right. alphanumeric codes that indicate content on the car and those are have history way back in General Motors okay. decades and decades and decades gotcha. the Z's all our Z's are tend to be performance options so Z51 Z06 the R1 yeah that's right okay. so um, Z cool. denotes a performance option now this retracting a hard top it seems as if the soft top would be the simplest way to go but obviously for security reasons and whatnot a hot how difficult is the, I mean just watching this well, you'll see it in a minute, but it's it's fascinating to see it uh, go through its whole. Uh, it's a very complicated mechanism, and a hard top is much more difficult to package because all the panels are rigid. Right. From the beginning, we were thinking we would do a soft top, but if you look at all the top echelon cars, most of them do retracting hard tops, right. and they do it because you get the quiet, you get the look. Right. Uh, canvas tops are kind of old school when you got a car that's this modern. Uh, you've got the security for the interior. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why uh, folding hardtop makes a lot of sense. It's a huge challenge to engineer, especially when you fold it into an engine compartment so you have all the thermal issues. So you're folding this thing down, it's got rubber seals on it, it's got nice interior trim, suede and everything, and now you're putting it in an engine compartment that's just inches above an exhaust manifold. Right, right. So uh, managing all the thermal uh, on this car was a big challenge on the coupe, and it's just as much a challenge on the convertible. So we had to really isolate uh, the convertible from the engine with heat shielding and a bulkhead in there. And it must be very powerful, very compact electric motors that pull this down. It almost seems like you can almost do it manually and do it, but obviously you want it to be electric. Right. How much, I mean, you say it's only 80 pounds. I mean, that's, what are they, about seven pounds a piece, the motors? Probably? There's six oh. motors in there. Uh, there's, there's a six. lot, there's six motors. Yeah. There's a lot of linkages. There's new seals. You, you can see the the whole construction of the back end of the car is different. Right. The nice thing about this car is we don't have to reinforce it because it's a convertible. Exactly same chassis underneath. Right. A lot of folks have to do a lot of reinforcement. That's why there's a big difference in mass between their coupes and their convertibles. We design it as a convertible from the beginning. So we don't have to reinforce the chassis. All we have to do is accommodate all the motors, the wiring, the shielding, and so forth for the roof. Something that's, I wouldn't call it controversial, but people really react to is sort of the fighter pilot sort of uh, yeah. uh, cockpit. Um, did you look at aircraft or did, is this just sort if of? If you walk through our design studio, you'll see posters of aircraft plastered all over the place. And uh, everybody has this idea of what a jet fighter interior looks like. Mm -hmm. The reality doesn't actually usually oh, match. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, it's pretty Spartan. It's pretty technical, functional, hard surfaces. You know, uh, but that goes back to, to the early days with Harley Earl and stuff with the World War II and the fins and the, the Ventaports does, on, yeah. on, on you know the exhaust of a P thirty eight Mustang. I mean, so there's a lot of heritage between aeronautical and General Motors design, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we've made a big connection between the astronauts, the space program. We just introduced this convertible last week at Cape Canaveral. There was about a dozen astronauts there yeah. uh, for that reveal. It was really exciting to see that in the rocket garden with all the, the Well, of course, when it. I was a kid, I remember getting my issue of Life magazine with the three astronauts. They each got a Corvette for a dollar for a year. 
or two year, whatever it was. For and a year. Yeah, and we, we, we got to drive one. We tracked one down a while back in like our second season on the show. It was really exciting. I mean, they were all silver and they really wanted to, you know, these guys were American heroes, so they yeah. wanted to be in what's the closest thing to a rocket on four wheels would be the Corvette. Right. And you know, you'd see the astronauts driving off in their dollar Corvette, <laughs> which seemed like a huge bargain. They were all that. lobbying for that same deal oh, today. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was pretty amazing. And I love the way they've integrated the screen. I mean, so many modern cars, it just sort of stuck in the dash or it flips and folds and goes under. Yeah. Uh, but uh, nicely done there. So, you know, we try to take advantage of the fact that we have this structural backbone. So. Right. We, the stiffness of the car comes from that big center console, so we're leveraging that with the design to make that feel like a glove when you get into the car. It just wraps around you. And it's all driver focused. It's like, hey, don't even look at my screen. You know, it's a passenger. <laughs> hey, no, you can't see any of the gauges. No, it looks know. that way from here, but yeah. if you actually sit in the passenger no, I know. seat, it's not I, that bad. No, I know, but it's fun. But I just like the fact I like having my own little area yes, there. I but know. no, it, it's 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 really unique and interesting and different. Uh, a lot of people think standing outside the car, it looks like it might be claustrophobic on the yeah. inside, but it's really not. And there's actually more room than today's car. We put an extra inch of seat travel and more recline angle. We've had people up to seven feet. Oh, yeah. you know, Brad Garrett, I think. He was actually yeah. at the West Coast reveal, the convertible. He got in the car. He's a pretty big guy. In the other Corvette, you would have been maybe here. Yeah, something Whereas like here, that. you're closer to the front of the car. Yeah, your heels are almost on the front axle. Yeah, yeah, which is, which is really very cool. Even the steering wheel, you always think of a circle. Right. But it's not, but it's not really a rect. It's so, what, what is the name of that shape? Squircle. A squircle. A squircle is what design calls it. Now, did you just make that up right now? Or no, that or? no, I didn't make it up. <laughs> a squircle? I give credit to the design team for okay, that. Okay, okay. And it, it really came from, you know, I, and actually being old school, I always thought wheels should be round. Right. Both road wheels and steering yeah. wheels. And so we've had round wheels on Corvettes for a long time. And for they've actually been cheating up, meaning they're round, but the center of the wheel isn't the center of the circle. So the the wheel's actually slightly offset to yeah. give you a little more thigh clearance and yeah. a little more visibility or over the, you know, through the hole, the top of the rim. And so we did a flat bottom wheel a couple of years ago and folks like that. Uh, you look at race cars, you know, mm -hmm. they have extreme shapes. For this one, um, with the widescreen uh, reconfigurable display, we really wanted to pooch out the corners a little bit so you got a really good view of that display and create better handhold positions. So it's two spoke and either whether you were a nine and three or a two and 10 person, you have a perfect hand holding position for each right. one. And I like the fact there are very few controls on the wheel. I don't like these steering wheels where everything is, you know, <laughs> where I'm doing it. I'm like, I'm driving right now. It's just what I want yeah. to do. I want to drive the car. It's I mean, a balance because people few, want you've got radio conveni and, yeah. convenience, but uh, yeah. it's primarily a driving machine. Yeah, nicely done. Yeah, it, I, I think it's fantastic. And of course, the price point is what really freaks people out. I think people were just stunned by that as much as they were by the styling. It was like, what? Yeah. I think people, how can you make it? Right. Because if you well, that's and you brought it up before it, that would have been a different business strategy, and it would have been a safer business strategy to keep the old car in production, right? Move this one to a higher price point, and if you were starting a sports car company from scratch and you wanted to cover all those price points, you might do that. But as we were developing this car, we thought, you know what, we can we can go all in. Well, see, that's what I love about American manufacturing: the ability to make things and make them quickly and efficiently. And keep lowering. I mean, when uh, we won World War II, not just because we had the best soldiers, because we we had a plane coming out of Willow Run every hour. Right. I mean, we we were manufacturing aircraft faster, almost than they could shoot them down. Yeah. It was like, where are these planes coming? I mean, every hour another right. jet came out. You yeah. know, you went to England, and you know they kind of did the Spitfires and stuff by hand, and yeah. it, it took a while and did yeah. them in secret one at a time. Birds were boom, boom, every hour another right. plane left. And it's the same thing with this. I mean, you have, it's really manufacturing efficiencies like carbon fiber wheels. It's like uh, like the dual clutch transmission. You're able to make it at, at, at such a precise and a precision way that the cost just keeps coming down. Because right. there's nothing on here that a car in the $250,000 to half a million dollar range 
it, it's the same thing. Yeah. They've all, all got the same features. And these are some of the most complicated consumer products in the world. So, yeah. So many different pieces and parts that have to fit together, and we make one of these in five minutes. Yeah, every five, every five minutes a car every comes Every five off minutes the line. a car comes <laughs> off the line. That's, that's pretty, all right, all right John, you got five minutes. <laughs> Make a C8. Come on. Yep. You have five minutes to make that car. I mean, I, that's that's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, I always love it when the Europeans, old world craftsmanship. Well, I'm sorry, your thumb is not a laser. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your thumb is not in a, but you got a whole thing on it, handmade. Well, we use quite a mix. If you look yeah. at our weld shop where we weld the frame together, it's a ballet of robots. Right. Uh, there's very few people. So those nasty, dirty jobs that have to be super precise, uh, robots are the best at those. But if you look at our general assembly where you hand assemble the rest of the right. car, there's a lot of people. They have a lot of assist tools and things, but there's a lot of jobs that people need to do. And we're also at a point where, like in the old days, you've got the electric seat and all the adjustments. It's a safe way you take all that out. But almost, we're at the point now where these motors are almost not flyweight, but just yeah, a, uh, very small. And, the, and with the integration of electronics, yeah. every time you add a feature, you're not necessarily adding a wire. Right. You're adding a message communicating between computers, so it's not necessarily adding mass. Yeah. And I love how secret these guys are. <laughs> you know, two years ago, I got to show my car. This is my, I, I got to drive the uh, ZR1. We, you and I went 204 miles an we hour. Did, yes. So they gave me this little card, and it's got Zora's picture on there and everything just to show that we did it at Milford. I remember saying, tell me about the mid-engine. Oh, I don't know if we're gonna be doing that. Oh, I don't know if we're gonna make that. No, it's, it's right over there. I can see there's a cover on it. No, you know, you didn't see anything, Jay. And I could swear. No, no, there's nothing Don't there. look at that. Yeah, yeah, so hilarious. Very <laughs> funny, very funny. Well, let's show the top. Before we go for a drive, let's show how the top goes down. I have to admit, I I like the coupe. With the coupe, I just go like this and I put it in the trunk. Uh -huh. Do I lose any trunk space because the of The trunk this? space is um, just actually there. about exactly the same. Okay. So the shape of the opening is a little different because of the way the tonneau and right, the top right. folds. But you don't have those provisions in the trunk to, that hold the removable roof. Yeah. Um, so you get an advantage of that. So on paper, the number is the same. The shape is right, just a right. slightly different. Well, I just remember the old days, like with the old Lincolns, they would say, please remove everything from the trunk before you put the top down. <laughs> it's you, a trash compact. You, yeah, yeah, you'd literally cr crush everything. <laughs> This yeah. one you don't have to worry about. You don't lose any trunk space, uh, top up or top down, which is the first time we've done that on Corvette. Let's it's show the trunk, because I believe you have two. You have one in the front. Yes, just like the coupe, we have one in the yeah. front, one in the rear. And I think this has the most trunk space of any mid-engine car I can think of. Even if you just count the rear, yeah. that's true. And then we have the front as an extra. And that was a goal, wasn't it? I mean, you know, when you look at the NSX, maybe you could get a package of unfiltered cigarettes in there because the filter adds a little extra, uh, and that's about it. Whereas yes. this, uh, was that, do you have certain mandates like, car, yeah, all right, you can build it, but it's gotta be able to hold two golf bags, you've gotta have this, you've gotta have that. We have goals, right. you know, we know our customers really well, right. and like you mentioned, the last multiple generations have had the same luggage capacity as a mid-sized car. If right. you ask people to name why they want a sports car, luggage room isn't one of the reasons right. for purchase, but they sure like it when they have it. Right, right. And so we didn't want to just do a, you know, a play thing, a weekend toy right. kind of Corvette that couldn't be used for all those other things. So we said, we're gonna make it our mission uh, to put as much trunk room as we can, package everything as tightly as we can. Golf clubs is one thing, but we also had the removable roof since 84, we've had a roof that's right. removed, so you had to have a place for that roof. The roof's pretty big, so that mandates that you can't just have a little cubby up front. You have to have something that can take a whole car roof. Well, even the front one is pretty big. Let's show that one. Okay. This one, we were trying to figure out, obviously, golf clubs don't fit in this one. Ah, I didn't know there's a switch right there. Yeah, so, yeah. secret switch. Front yeah. and back, okay. there's a switch. Cool. Um, this one we sized around uh, airline 
rollerboard. Right. Um, so you can put one in horizontally, or uh, we have custom luggage for this car. Right. Uh, really nice, and you can put two of those top and bottom here and two in the back of you. Fitted you. luggage always Fitted makes luggage. me laugh. You know, I don't think guys that have these Go Wings and Aston Martins, and I always tell guys, your wife's not going to put her stuff in your stupid fitted luggage, okay? <laughs> it's just not going to happen, you know? And each bag fits just right. this way, and it costs you like a gazillion dollars. Now, what is the white uh, button there? What does that do? So that button, there's one in the front and one in the rear. It's mandated by law, and it's uh, for child protection. Oh, that's if, right. Yeah. If a child gets trapped in there, you know, the older brother puts the younger brother in the trunk, right, closes right. it, and runs away. Right. Um, that glows in the dark, and so that's the only thing they'd be able to see. If they push it, it's always on, it's always powered, and the, oh, okay. it opens. Yeah, I watched some movie the other day where they take a guy and they throw him in the trunk of the car. And I knew it was a late model car, and I'm going, you know, there's a little thing right there, just pull it in the it's trunk. It's in the dark. But they don't do that, you know. Little thing, hey, look, hey, jerk, look here. And the guy's like this, bang, bang, knocking. I go, look, just open it. But they don't, they don't tell you that. In the no. Movie, yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot. That's mandated. So you have that front and back. Yes, okay. front and back. And um, so if you have twins, you could have one in each. You area. could, yeah. and actually, I've seen three in yeah. already. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very cool. So with soft luggage, you can pack as much luggage as you can in today's car. Right. And uh, this stays relatively cool. That's one thing about prior Corvettes. You have the exhaust running underneath the trunk. It gets pretty hot back there. Right. Plus the sun coming through the back window. Right. Because we've got our radiators on this car outboard. The front actually stays pretty cool, and so we tell people put your beer here and your pizza in the back because okay. it's a little bit warmer right, in the right. back. So, like on this model Z51, I know it probably has an extra radiator. How many radiators total in the car? So for Z51, there'd be three radiators. Right. So in the front, we have one on each side, and they're surprisingly big. If we took off this bodywork, right. you'd see they're quite large. There's also a condenser on each side, so that's for the air conditioning. And then the way the system works is we take the hot coolant from the engine up to the front, split it through those two radiators, and that very cool coolant runs the length of the car. And then on Z51, it goes through another radiator that's taking air in through the large quarter panel openings. And that extra cool coolant immediately goes into water to water, water to oil coolant for both the engine oil and the trans loop. Cool. And do you use a water-based coolant? I mean, a regular... Yeah, so it's a conventional coolant, it's yep, a, like any other car. Right, right, yep. right, right. So that's what you talked about, how do we offer the car for less money. General Motors buys a lot of coolant right. for all cars and trucks around right. the world, so that's an example of where we have advantages of economies of scale. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, just all the bracketry, it's, 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 just, it's just amazing. Let's, let's bring this down again. Uh, what else? Anything we else? We could talk about this mid window. I, we didn't talk about that. That's kind of a cool feature. Yeah, tell me. So this obviously has retracted. Yes. Much like the uh, 1958 Mercury Turnpike <laughs> Cruiser with the breezeaway. That's Remember what the, we were going for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the breezeaway window. <laughs> I only mention that because I just found a uh, 58 Continental Mark III, the heaviest, longest car ever built in America post-war. And that's saying and, something. It, it, it's got that rear window. They, uh -huh. And they used to have the smoking window, so it's smoke, the smoke window. Because it has four, it has four ashtrays. So it's, it's, just, it's just smoking. <laughs> and you open that, it all goes out the back. So this, this, can you put this up while the window's down, that window? Actually, that window has an independent control. It had to go up and down to articulate the top, and we decided right. why not make it independently controllable. Gotcha. So it has its own switch on the door, oh, okay. right next to the convertible switch. So even with the top up, if you want that little vent, extra oh, vent, you can, you can put that down oh, so you can okay. hear the engine better, right. and it gives you better cabin ventilation. Oh, cool. Um, and then when the top is down, you can move it up or down as well, depending on how much recirculating air you want into the cabin. And so in combination with the side glass going up and down and that going, there's all sorts of different ways to configure the car top down to give you comfort depending on what the weather is. I always wonder what the aftermarket boys do with stuff something like this because you guys have got everything down to a science. It's almost, there's almost these days no exhaust system that's better than stock. I mean it might be louder but you're not going to do it better because you guys have got it Right, uh, and timed and every other thing like that. We have our NPP. We have an optional exhaust right. which has valves in it. Um, and when the valves are open, it's basically like a straight pipe. It's hard right. to do better than a okay. straight pipe in terms of restriction. So but you can open it from electronically from the dash, right? Yes, you can okay. set it up how you want. We have so the different modes. No Allen screws track. opening up lake pipes. No, 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 no. 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 I know. <laughs> 
Okay. Oh, oh, so that is an option. I was that is an option. That. NPP, it? it's called. Okay. It's very popular. It's, we have it on today's car. So that's our answer to the aftermarket. But I have to say the aftermarket folks are super creative. Right. Um, they also don't have to meet uh, noise pass by laws that, right. that we do. And so they have an advantage that way. But uh, have we passed the point where an aftermarket exhaust will then affect emissions? I uh, mean, like if, if you put an aftermarket system on a car like this, in California, every three years, you've got to get it inspected. You've got to right. pass admission. Most likely, it won't pass because it's all. It all works together. Yeah, That's true. It, works as a unit. Um, it depends on the system yeah, yeah. and whether you're doing just a cat back versus you know people want to put headers on the car. Right. You know it, that would definitely affect it. Yeah, pretty amazing. And we've got a whole series of buttons there. You yes. Know, I used to love, I've got a 63 split window and I was, I remember when I was 13 and the radio was sideways. Oh, I thought that was the <laughs> coolest thing. The radio goes this way. You have to sort of do this when you're tuning and it. You know, it just because just it was different, you yeah. know. And Our radio I, is still this way. Yeah, I love the fact that it, uh, all those buttons along the side, this, plus the, again, the passenger. What are you pressing? Never mind. Well, I'm some of those are for the passenger. Yeah. Passenger's heating and cool seat. Uh, right. It's a separate passenger temperature control. So those are all the interior comfort controls, HVAC controls. Right. So there's really no stripper Corvette, is there? There's really no base model with not really with mechanical seats and uh, you know, everything. They're so all I, the starting car yeah. is very well equipped and yeah. it looks well equipped. Right. We don't do what other people do. Is if you get the base car, there's a whole bunch of blanks. Yeah. Like uh, the row of switches oh, oh, yeah. ahead of the. I used to have when you get the <laughs> clock and I had this, all the numbers, but the hands were missing, so people would know you're too cheap. <laughs> to, buy, to buy the clock. <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was my favorite thing. Oh, no, yeah. We tool up separate pieces so it looks like a complete car even if you don't get all the content. Yeah. No, yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing. Because that was another thing I heard people go. I, I, when I told people it was 60, you'll never be able to buy one. You know, it's going to be 100 by the time. But no, I mean, I, I know a guy just bought one. And I think he paid 64, you know, with all the things. He's and got one on order. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. got one on order. And, and, it's, and it's he great. won't be disappointed. We've shown media some standard cars, or maybe the base car just was Z51. So mm -hmm. for somebody who does want the lightest car for the track, it doesn't feel like you've cheaped out at all. It yeah. feels like a very complete car. And, and is this a limited production, or will they make as many as they can sell? I mean, you put sort of... Well, usually when we bring in a new Corvette, we're capacity constrained. Right. Meaning more people are placing orders than we can build. We'll make as many as we can. And what is the n normal run of Corvette? 25,000 a year? 30,000 a year? 30-ish, plus 30 or minus. When we bring right. it out, we can sell a little over 30. Right. And then, you know, if the car's been out for six, seven years, then it'd typically be under, yeah. you know, 20s. Right, right. That's typical. Uh, we're hoping that this one sells more. We're doing oh, right hand drive for the first time. We're going to Australia. We're going to oh, countries right? we've never been to before. Yes. Oh, that's exciting. There was a big party in Australia when we announced right hand drive. Well, you know, I would say, God, it was 20 years ago. I guess it was 1999. I drove a Corvette on the Autobahn. We took one too. And everywhere I went, people ran up to, because to them, it's like a Ferrari. It's right, like, it's, it's rare. so exotic. They never saw it before. And with all, the Mercedes and, and BMW is limited to 155, some sort of gentleman's agreement, 155 miles an hour. I was running <laughs> We're not gentlemen. 171, 172. I was just yeah. flying by people. And yeah. they, they would try to catch me, and they couldn't. And right. it, was, it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Eating a McDonald's hamburger, driving a Corvette. Hey, I'm an American. We yeah. don't recommend that. Exactly. Well, so, yeah, we go 194 on the standard car, which is pretty darn fast. It's the fastest standard Corvette we've ever right. had. Well, that's my favorite thing with you. When, when uh, we went to the ZR1, we got in the car and I said, well, you must do this every day. Uh, when was the last time you went 200 in a Corvette? And he said, I never have. And I go, really? So your first time was with a comedian on a track he's never seen before? What could go wrong? Yeah, what could That's go what wrong? what you say all the time. Well, but see, nothing did. And <laughs> I was did. amazed at how far aerodynamics have come. Yeah. I mean, I've got a Carrera GT and in 2005, we went to Talladega and we did 100 laps at like between 180, 190. And I was, woo, it was doing this, you know, yeah. it was like, yeah, you know, you could just, every little input, you could feel the car slide. Yet, on the 2017 Corvette, it was, it was rock steady. I mean, we just went right to 200 form, kept it there. 
And you and I had a conversation, and we talked, and yeah. we slowed down to 150, and I felt like we were going 60 miles an hour. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty amazing. So. It didn't show up on the show, but the only thing that gave me pause, because we didn't rehearse that. Right, right. As uh, so we went to 200 plus, right. and then you started slowing down. But you didn't slow down a lot. You slowed down to like 190, as right. I recall. And then you started doing lane changes. Do yeah. you remember that? <laughs> I was like, what's this guy doing? This might have been a mistake. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but you told me later, you were kind of comparing the aero stability. You know, if you're asking the steering to do what it needs to do at those speeds, does the it, car feel light? And it was, it was amazing. Uh, it, yeah. was, it, was, it was pretty cool. Can we take it for a ride? Absolutely. Let's do That's it. That's what it does best. Let's do it. <laughs> Is that open exhaust now or no? I don't know what it's set to actually. That's it's on tour mode, so it may just be the bass sound. Okay. It's funny for a Corvette to have the noise behind you instead it is. of in front of you. <laughs> it sounds familiar, but it's coming from a yeah, different spot. Yeah. You're not feeling well, that is the best governor I've ever seen. <laughs> it is torque managed, so you're not getting full output. Until right, it's right. broken in, we actually right. limit the torque okay. of the engine, try to break yeah. in, you know, you're obviously not behaving very well. You know, right, this right. is not what you're supposed to do on a brand new car. Right, right. So we want the gears to all bed in nicely, gotcha. and so we limit the torque intentionally. Right, right, okay. <laughs> it's still a safe level of performance. Okay. Now, obviously, this is a pre-production model, so it's got some, uh, the horsepower is somewhat limited, also because it, uh, it's not fully broken in yet, or even warmed up, right? Yeah, we've learned over the years, in fact, we see people buying Corvettes, and they do a burnout right out of the dealership. Right, right. And that's not really good for the machinery. You really right. want to break it in easy. Differential, all the gears, they want to bed in and smooth polish each other. Right. So right. they have a nice, long, quiet life. And so for this car, it's the first time we've done it. For the first 500 miles, we dial back the torque a little bit. It's still a very powerful car, but we dial back the torque a little bit uh, so you don't damage it. People are really going to be surprised how quiet this car is because we've had to insulate the accessory drive noise right. behind you because that doesn't sound very good. Instead, we plumb the intake around the outside of the car, breeze through the, the quarter vents so you can hear some of that intake sound behind you and then, of course, the exhaust behind. I like this wheel. I like the fact it's not round. Got plenty of knee room. And you've got about five inches behind you. Right, right. And you can go from full open like we have now put the side glass up and then you put right. the mid glass up too if you want to be outside open air but just tone it down a little bit. And the front end literally just drops off. It just drops I, I off mean, past you, your toes. You don't even see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Makes the car feel really small on track. Plus you're not sitting this way. No. You know? That's right. Some people because the front tires are so far rearward yeah. and they consume so much space because right, they the steer. Inside, what... It's easy to put the pedal box. That's the easy solution is you put yeah. the pedal box towards the inboard side of the car. We have a dead straight, column dead straight at yeah, you, the pedal great. straight. And nice that, dead pedal also. That's the great thing about the F1, is you, being in the middle, you can be nine feet tall, and your, <laughs> your feet go all the way to the front, and the A-arms and everything are yeah. over here. You know. Yeah. It was interesting when we first started taking the camo off, the cars didn't have badging on them. Right. Because there's no point labeling a Corvette on if you're going to try to keep right, the right. fact that it's a Corvette secret. So we were all driving around these cars as they are, but no badges. and. It was amazing the guesses we'd get on what yeah. people thought it was. Almost nobody thought it was a Corvette, except for the people who followed the mid-engine Corvette story. Right. So this one right now is not delivering full horsepower. No, it is not. It's a pre-production car, so obviously where it's, is it governed as well? It it's governed, uh, it would if it wasn't governed, because we, right. have, we have finished our calibrations on performance. Um, and we've done that for the coupe and it's shared with the convertible so it will make full horsepower but it's dialed back about 15 20 percent okay right now just to preserve all the chassis componentry right. uh, during the break-in period 
But this is about as close to production as you can get, correct? Yes, right yeah. now most everything comes off of production tools. This right. is an EX VIN, so an experimental VIN. Right. Uh, this car was built in Bowling Green down the line. Uh, it's not fully set up yet because we're still building the seventh generation car there. Uh, but all the operators are getting trained, they're learning, learning to put the parts together and exactly what sequence. Uh, how much work can be done at each station, things like that. So this would be a pilot car, is that what they call you it? You can call it a pilot car. Yeah. yeah. Now does this get crushed right afterwards? Is that, they used to do that in the old days. Uh, it will never go to sale. Uh, it may be crushed, not immediately. We'll use it for a variety of different right. things. Sometimes we use it as a basis for some future model. We'll do experiments on it. Uh, but eventually it'll be disposed of, right. even though it's perfectly. It breaks all of our hearts because all of us would love to see one of these in our garage, but right, we right. can't. <laughs> and you're going to be building, as you said, uh, right-hand drive for Japan and Australia. UK, and yeah. UK. We've sold in Japan and UK because it's legal to sell left-hand drive right. cars there. And actually, we're surprised the seventh generation was surprisingly popular in Japan. It, we sold a lot more than we expected to yeah. there. But there's Corvette clubs in Australia, and we've never sold the, the car there. They can import them when they're old, the older right, cars, right. or they can spend the whole price of the car, maybe two times the price of the car, to convert one uh, to right-hand drive and bring it in. Wow. So people are paying 300 grand for a Z06 to bring it in there. Wow. And so I've met some of these people. They fly over and come to our Corvette events and then try to twist our arms into doing a right-hand drive. Yeah. Obviously, it's pretty expensive to tool everything up in a mirror version. So, uh, but this time we said, you know, this is gonna be a global car. We wanna sell it fully uh, representative of the American car in all markets. And that meant doing right-hand drive. Could you sell a right-hand drive Corvette here or is that illegal? That would be illegal, yes. Oh, it is. Yeah. But you can import one. You can import one under right. certain restrictions. Right, right. That's but we can't, we're not allowed to build them here. Right, right. But they will be built in Bowling Green, correct? All of them will be built in yeah. Bowling Green. And one of the advantages, actually, of a mid-engine architecture is it's slightly easier to do right-hand sure. drive because you don't have all the right, engine right, and brake right. hardware up there conflicting with each other. So it's less complicated to flip everything and over. And what percentage of production would that be? 5%? Of right-hand drive? Yeah. Probably very small. We don't know. Yeah. Since we've never sold in Australia, we've got a lot of passionate customers right. down there. We don't know how many people will actually step up and buy right, it. Right, right. We'll find out. You know, we're, Now, would it be sold under Holden, or is it still, what, what is it? It's going to be sold as a Chevrolet Corvette. We will use uh, Holden as a distribution network. Because I, I always assumed at some point Corvette would become its own brand. Just be Corvette, not Chevrolet Corvette. And in a way, it is. You know, it's kind of unique in itself. Yeah. It does. We don't put the big bow tie on the car. It doesn't right, say right. Chevrolet. It's it's a brand unto itself, but it's definitely a proud member of the right, Chevrolet right. family. Yeah. Now you've been a Corvette for how many years? Now? Twenty-six plus. 26 yeah. yeah. Started on the fifth generation. But now it seems like with Mark Royce in there, you've got a real car guy as president. That's absolutely true, and we have more than Mark. Mary is also right, a but car I mean, person. But people performance-oriented versus selling unit-oriented. You know what I mean? I remember in the old days, <laughs> there'd be rows of cars sitting in parking lots just manufactured. Get, just get them out there, get them out yeah. there, get them out there, you know? Whereas now, it all seems to be focused on uh, performance and, and competing with the best in the world. Yeah, it's all about the quality for the segment. For our segment, it's performance-oriented. Yeah. But I think uh, just doing quality cars is a mantra throughout the company. And it's funny to me to watch both the English and the Germans grudgingly give Corvette their due, which they never <laughs> really did. But you know, they always made fun of something in the interior, or they'd find something that broke, or you know, whatever. Yeah. But now they're going, oh, okay. Maybe well, it's we, okay. we know we're commanding respect. Whenever we introduce a new one, they ask to have one borrow one, sometimes two of them. Right. And we don't often agree to that. We say, well, when they're for sale, you're welcome to buy right, one. Right, right. Oh, there you go. There you yeah. go. A little more character there. Yeah. And it's interesting because the exhaust is farther away from you. Yeah. the occupant compartment so much farther forward. The exhaust tips are 16, 17 inches farther yeah. away, which doesn't sound like a lot, but there's a lot between you and it also with the engine. All the the hardware and the body. And with work. no drive shaft, you're almost gaining horsepower because the engine is going directly 
to the rear wheels. You lose that horses. spin loss right, uh, right. of the prop shaft. But the most reason you gain horsepower is uh, intake and exhaust restriction. Yeah. Um, on the front engine car, there's not a good way to snorkel out to get to cool air. Yeah. It's, there's a real pinch point, and the exhaust gets pinched to get between your feet and down the tunnel. On this car, there's no pinch points. It flows right in through the quarters. It's like an old school, uh, very large oval uh, air filter. And then the exhaust routes, you know, it's got a high, right. like mini headers and right out the back under the trunk. So this is the only Corvette convertible in the state of California. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's kind of cool. <laughs> You know, Corvette, it's, it's like the hometown team, you know. People root for the brand, and it's, ni it's nice to see. We have uh, a lot of passionate uh, customers, and we also have a lot of passionate fans who maybe can't afford one, but at least know about it. Some, some people, that's the only Chevy they know is the Corvette. Yeah, but you know, it's one of those cars that's aspirational. You know, if you're a blue collar guy, you got a plumbing business, and you're reasonably successful, this is a real supercar. You have a real shot of getting. You yeah, know? it's. I mean, it's attainable for anybody with a decent job. You know, when we do the Lamborghinis and Ferraris, we'll get 700, 800,000 hits. When we did this short video the last time at the introduction, it was five million. <laughs> I mean, it was it was like whoa. Now, right now, I'm about to use what I think is the coolest feature. You know, a lot of cars have a list system that brings the front end up, and most do that. You have to wait. This pops right up. But the coolest thing is it's GPS. Tell us what that is exactly. So every car has a GPS system. It knows where you are. Right. So uh, I just hit the button. We lifted the front because we're coming off a steep driveway here out onto right. the road. And uh, every time you do that, a uh, message comes up on the cluster asking if you want to remember this location. Right. And all you do is hit the button on the steering wheel and it remembers that GPS location. So every time you come to that location, it automatically lifts for you. So if you forget one time, you don't scrape the nose. It lifts, right. and if you're coming in fast, it'll start lifting sooner and it lifts in two to three seconds and it's up. Wow, so if you live on a street or you have a driveway and you're, you know, just distracted, it'll automatically it'll lift. automatically bring see, it up. That's got to be the coolest feature. But that got when we did the reveal in yeah. Tustin. Yeah. I think that was one of the biggest applause lines was yeah. the front yeah. lift system because Corvettes and all sports cars are inherently low, and so to keep that performance orientation, that low center of gravity, the low nose in the front for aero, engineers have to struggle with that compromise. So enabling the front to go up almost two inches really gets people through a lot of the, the heartburn. But the biggest applause line is the $60,000. I mean, We that knew was, that was gonna be that, that was a shocker. A revelation. I mean, that was like, because you just expect things to be, uh, everything just goes up and up and up. And no matter what field you're in, everything costs more. Hotel, restaurants, gasoline, everything. Yeah. And to get a, a, a car with this level, Everybody says to me, how do they do it for that price? Which you never hear in the car industry. Oh, that's way, <laughs> oh, that's way too much. That's crazy. You know, right. you, you just don't hear it. You and don't hear that. It's refreshing and it's kind of fun. But you're right, after the reveal, all the media rushed up to the stage and that's the question I heard over and over. Right. How, how, how would you do it for 60? And it was the same thing that people are saying, well, you won't really be able to get one for 60. Right, that was the you're other gonna, thing. They're gonna advertise that, and but you won't be able to buy one of those. Yeah, and from what I hear, I know a few people have ordered it, and the dealer took the order at the dealer price. So it yeah. sounds like there's some pressure to not sort of gouge at the dealer level, I hope. Yeah, and the dealers are all independent businesses. They can right. do what they want, but right. we really have, talk to them about not raising the price. Um, sell it for sticker, that's what we intended, that's what we did our business case right. around. Um, so we want people to get it for the price we say it costs. And of course, if you want to spend more, we have ways to spend more. There's lots of options. Yeah, that's that are good to know. <laughs> well, you know something, you get to know a lot of the magazine guys, and this might be one of those rumors that you hear, but I've heard it too many times that when they do comparisons, uh, some of the Italian exotic companies will say, if there's going to be a Corvette, we don't want to be compared to that because with the price differentiation, even if it is faster, it's not that much faster. Not as much faster yeah. to justify it. Yeah. They justify the difference. So. Yeah. 
But I tell you, there's almost every uh, high quality company in the world wants to be in this space. Every elite company, they have a flagship, a high performance sports car. Right. So a lot of their best engineers work on this stuff. And so there are a lot of very capable companies. All right, let's put the top up. Yeah, the nice thing about this car is if you're going under 30 miles an hour, yeah. you decide you want the top top down or top up. Ow, my hair. OK, OK, I'll put the top up. <laughs> put it up. 16 seconds, and she's done. Wow, that's pretty amazing. You've got all kinds of room, all kinds of headroom, too. Yep. I think there's actually, for some big people where they have the seat all the way back, I think it's actually a little bit more headroom yeah. on the convertible than on the coupe. And of course the window here. Yep, so that's still open. Yeah. You can choose to have that open or closed independently. Now when I lock the car and walk away, that'll go up and lock, correct? You have to manually, just like any car, you have to oh, okay. close the windows, close it up. Right, okay. It does have a feature that a lot of cars have. You want it, it will automatically lock and fold the mirrors and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's very comfortable. Yeah. Not cramped at all. And quiet and smooth. And so people are going to be surprised, I think, when they get in it. People have the idea of old Corvettes as being kind of harsh, hard to live with, and people have the idea of an exotic being kind of hot and hard to right. live with. This car is cooler, more comfortable than any Corvette we've ever done. You think that. you'll sell more? Convertibles versus hardtops, because it's now essentially a hardtop. I, mean, I think so, because you're not asking people to sacrifice anything. Right, right. You get all yeah. the looks and the security right, and the quiet, right, right. and you don't lose any luggage room, top up or top down. Right. Um, I think so. Um, I hope so. And if you look at the other people who offer retracting hardtop spider versions of their cars, they sell most of their cars actually that way. Right, right. Yeah. But to me, when I take the top off the regular C8. It's almost as open as this. Almost. But you do have that standing structure behind you right, and that right. stuff that comes across the middle, right. that changes the airflow right, and it's right. noisier. Right, this is right. quieter. It right, just has right. the fairing behind your head. Right. Um, so it is quieter. It's more true an open air experience. But I do like seeing the engine compartment with the other one. That's the trade-off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That is the trade-off. And we did look to see if it was possible to do a folding top that would leave the engine exposed. It would have been a bad top and a bad little teeny window. Uh, probably would have had to have been a canvas top, which would have looked kind of right. cheap on uh, an otherwise very expensive looking car. But my all-time favorite thing is there's no Corvette SUV. That's your favorite thing, is there? Because I get that question all the time. Why don't you do a Corvette SUV? I, no. Porsche does it. Why don't you do it? I, no, I don't. Well, they have to do it. But Corvette has been successful, I think, because we've stuck to our knit. You know, we, right. we keep focused on what we do, and people say, oh, we've deviated from what we do. It's still two-passenger car, V8 powered. Right. It's the driving experience. As I said before, we're not experiencing the 100% of the power of the C8 Corvette because this is a pre-production model that is somewhat governed. I mean, it's still pulling really strong. But there's probably another 20 or 30 percent that's not in this one because it's you know it's got the the what do you call it, the experimental plate on it yeah ex vin yeah it's an and experimental vin on because it because it's given sometimes to be driven by auto show employees and yes. stuff like that it's been transported around the country transported around the country yeah they're not uh, doing burnouts with it but yeah. it, it gives you a good idea of how powerful it. How yeah, powerful and it how is. quick the trans response. It, it downshifts yeah, really quick. Yeah, and it quick. just shifts so quality, you know? That's what I hate about torque converters, that sh <laughs> you know, that weird kind of, whereas it's just literally just bang, bang, bang. It, 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 it feels like quality. Yeah, and even the city driving, just creeping around, the yeah. idle creep and stuff, it, in that, it feels like a fluid torque converter. It's very fluid off the line. No, it's a lot very of good. it's essentially a manual transmission with friction clutches. They're they're wet friction clutches, but it's very smooth off the line, and the gear shifts are real smooth at low speeds. And you know, constantly trying to bring down the demographic is very important. You know, because for a while there it was creeping up. Yeah, older guys getting the younger guys weren't interested in Corvette. Yeah. Now that you've got the science and the and, and the engineering, all of a sudden I see a lot of young people interested in this. Oh yeah, I think it's fantastic. We didn't we didn't do it expressly for that reason, but we're really, really lucky that both the physics reasons to do it and the demographic reasons to do it lined up. 
So in a way, I say we had no choice. We really didn't have a choice but to do this. Well, what a thrill this has been. I, as I said before, this is a pre-production model, so we're not getting the full impact of horsepower and a few other things. But it's 99% there. It's 99% I mean, yeah. there. Uh, this is what the car will look like. This is how it'll operate. This is how it'll sound and feel. And this is how it'll sound and feel. And boy, all those things are just great. You know, it, it, it's such a leap forward. Suddenly, the C7 just seems a little old-fashioned. I, I hate to say that because... Uh, We're not going to get me to say anything bad about I like, the C7. I like my front-engine Corvette, but this, you know, all I can say is it feels like the future. Ted, thank you very much, my thank friend. Thank you, Jay. Always a thrill to have the uh, chief engineer come by. That's when you know they're dedicated. You know, when they send their top guy, it's not a <laughs> marketing guy. It's not the guy with the stripes and this. Yeah, yeah, it's just great. It's just great. So, well, you are the first person to drive, first person outside GM to drive a Corvette convertible, the new oh, cool. well, thank convertible. You. Thank so I wanted to be here for sure. Well, it's an honor, uh, and I appreciate it. You and I have a history in doing these things in Corvettes. So let's it, do it again it, someday. Great. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> and uh, watch this space, folks, because there's going to be a lot more exciting stuff coming from Corvette. As an American, I must say it does make me proud to know it's manufactured right here in the United States and uh, just great. So once exciting. again, thank you, my friend. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys next week.